Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of Pastor Volodi, I would like to say a few words, uh, of course, on, uh, also on behalf of the Limbu Church family. First of all, we would like to express our condolences to the family and all the friends. And also, but we know that we are people with hope, right? Uh, we know that uh, Brother Lynn Bartholomew went to rest with that hope. And on that very day when the Lord Jesus comes, that hope will be justified. So uh, allow me just on behalf of our church family, express also our gratitude. We're very thankful, Brother Lin, we know we can, he cannot hear, but, but we want all of you to know that he, his ministry ma uh, me, me, meant a lot for this church and, and also <clears throat> especially during the health program. Pastor Volodi just asked me to tell you that. He was a great asset, great help. So uh, may God bless you, and may God, God be your comforter. Until that day, day when the Lord comes, I know nothing can, nothing can compensate loss like that. And I, I never seen, I just told uh, uh, <coughs> Brother Schultz that I never seen such a, such a memorial when the, the building is just packed. He was definitely a loved person, loved by God and by people. So may God bless all of you and be with you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gregory. I want to thank each one of you for being here today and uh, coming to share this time as we remember Lynn's life, as we reflect on his life, and as we uh, reflect on some of the things that we know were very meaningful to him. And uh, so to begin, I would uh, first of all like to just share a scripture from the Bible that um, he thought was so precious. And I take these few words uh, from the book of Psalm. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So once again, thank you for being here. And uh, I would like to invite you to bow your heads with me for prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we count it a privilege to be in your presence on this Sabbath day. And we count it a privilege to be able to come and to think of one of your children that has loved you, has walked with Jesus many years in his life. But now that voice is silenced, and so, Lord, we feel that loss. And yet we are comforted by the Comforter. And we thank you, Lord, for that gift. And now as we reflect upon your word and this precious life, we ask your blessing upon our assembly here. In Jesus' name, amen.
precious memories, unseen angels sent from somewhere to my soul. Now they linger ever near me, and the sick past and fold precious father loving mother fly across the forever years and old home scenes of my child in fond memory appears precious memories how they linger how they ever flood my soul in the still sacred scenes unfold as I travel on life's pathway I know not what the years may hold as I wander my hope grows fond Precious memories flood my soul. Precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul in the stillness of the midnight precious sacred scenes unfold precious sacred scenes unfold Well, here we are again. Can you believe it? Somebody asked me if I hate doing these things, and I just have to say it's kind of a bittersweet thing because Lynn's at rest. You know, we have a lot ahead of us, some of us at least. Uh, but Lynn's at rest. That's the sweet part. Not for us, but for him. When I think of Lynn, I think of more than I can tell you right now. More than you'd want to hear. But the first thing that I think of is a life in motion. A life in motion. Oh, before I get started, I should say, just to clear up any misconception about his death, uh, the pathology report said that the actual cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning. And now considered by those who knew him best, a tragic accident. Immediate circumstances leading to the poisoning will remain unknown. 
But there's a certainty. And the certainty is that he died doing one of his favorite things. He was a project man. He was putting his mind to the challenge of figuring out how to make something work. He had purchased a snowplow for the front of his tractor and he was, he was building a frame to mount it with. To be there in that scene immediately following his passing, you could see the action. You could see what he was involved in. And he had remarked to Kathy just a short while before that when it was his time to go, he wanted to go with his boots on. And if you note the little display out there, that's why they're there. I say a life in motion, but it was cut short. From our perspective, it was cut short prematurely. To the grander scheme of things, in God's time, we don't know. We really don't. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, there's something about this we must trust him with. Now, one thing I know was that Lynn was a man of faith and of commitment to God. And I wanna, I'll say more about this as I go along, but I have to go back some 45 plus years in my memory. And I have to say that this picture fits that scene in my mind. I was at, uh, I don't remember what the occasion was, uh, some little breakfast visit or something, I can't remember. I was at um, Carol and Kathy and Ron's home with their parents. Uh, Kathy hadn't showed up yet. She was gonna show up in a few minutes and I heard that um, she was bringing, I don't know whether you were married to him or a boyfriend or a fiance. Anyway, 45 years ago, whatever. How long have you been married? 46 and a half, so you must have been married then. <laughs> and so I was curious to see who this guy was. And when he came in the door, that's what I saw. Big smile, smile as big as all outdoors, and a new element had just entered the house. <laughs> that was Lynn. But you know what I, what I remember about that is the smile. The smile. I knew that um, Kathy was on a life adventure with this guy. Well, Lynn was a man who grappled with life. He grappled with faith. He grappled with religion. He grappled with the church. He philosophized a little. He grappled with mission. The secular life, uh, the world of work life, he had that high-risk profession of drilling, water well drilling, from uh, wells in India to Central America to all over the Northwest and other places probably too. But whether at home or abroad, I don't know when it happened in his life, maybe from the start, but I think it grew through time, this thing of his profession the perfect platform for the ministry of the gospel, for providing clean water for people to drink, a metaphor for life to bring the saving water of life, to share Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so Lynn identified with these 
Bible truths. I just mentioned a few of them here. These, this is in the words of Jesus from Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. John 4, 13 and 14. Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. John was one of those apostles that used highly symbolic and often spiritual language to describe what he was saying. I don't think it's any accident that there must be some kind of collaboration, some kind of um, affinity that Lynn must have had for this book because of the way he talked a few weeks ago when we had the memorial for Stan. You might remember we talked just very briefly, almost in passing, this dialect that Stan seemed to have, for those of you who knew Stan. Well, Lynn had a language of his own, too. And I'll give an example of that in a little bit. But he could identify with this idea of drinking the water of life from the Word of God. Another one from John 6, verse 35. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 7, 37. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. That's what Jesus said. And that's what Lynn believed. A thirsty soul. This thing that we are, made with this the spiritual dimension, we have this thirst for something. And only Jesus can fill it. Only Jesus can fill it. Lynn knew that. Now, did he always get it right? It's okay for us to be a little transparent here, isn't it? Did he always represent his conviction the way he knew it should be profiled in Christ Jesus? No. And he would be the first to admit that he had feet of clay. But I said he grappled with life. And in that grappling, he himself drank often of that heavenly water. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the loving grace of his Lord Jesus. Some of you, uh, many of you, knew him far better than I did. I really got to know him over the past 10 years, pastoring in his church. And so I learned some things about Lynn as I went along. Um, warts and all. It was, you know, it was, um, it was an experience for me to get better acquainted with him from year to year. And I'm aware that sometimes on the job, you know, when, when Lynn was on the job, it was all business. And that's what I got. That's the impression I got. Don't mess around with the equipment. Do it right, or you're going to get hurt. And if somebody's on the job, they're going to get some instruction, and it may not be in a soft little voice, because that's not the way Lynn talked. And if it was on the job, you're going to get the instruction, and you're going to get it in a loud bullhorn. Um, I have to say just what it was about a year ago, we're taking some trees down there at the Oh, no, but when I arrived, you were already in the tree. Lynn wasn't up there. Your dad wasn't up there. But I could see some pride there. His boy's up there doing the job. 
then you'd shout something now and again. <laughs> Just to be sure you're not going to cut your line or fall out of the tree. Yeah, we added a little bit more for you, didn't we? But my point here is, on the job, he was business. Now, most of my relationship with Lynn was not that kind of environment. I just want to acknowledge that. Easy for... Yeah, easy for your feelings to get hurt, maybe. My association with Lynn, mostly in the work of the church, mostly in ministry, and for many years, that faithful attendee, when he wasn't on the job somewhere, at our staff meetings. Kathy, I know there's going to be such a huge hole here for you, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to get used to that. It's not seeing him in staff. I say Lynn grappled with life. And he grappled to have the experience of the Holy Spirit in his life. His Bible shows devotional study. I, uh, he had several. This one here... I brought the others back home to the family yesterday, but this one I hung on to for a few minutes longer. I found it heartwarming to thumb through the pages and note the marks, mark after mark after multitudinous marks. I remember when he got this Bible. Oh, by the way, one of the Bibles I brought back has your picture in it. I've known guys carry pictures of their kids in their wallet. I, I've never known a, a man to carry a picture of his wife in his Bible. Now, maybe they do. I, sorry, Linda, I didn't have one in mine. <laughs> now, now I'm going to have to have one. He set a good example for me. But yes... I remember when he got it back in 2012. He saw me, I brought one in one day, and he said, what do you got there? And I said, well, it's my new Bible. He says, let me see that. He looked at it, he thumbed through it. Oh, he says, I gotta have one of those. <laughs> next thing I knew, probably about the next week, he had one. And as I went through here, I just noticed, like I said, it was just, and I thought, in four years, I suppose if you went through and just marked things, you know, you could do that. But I could tell that this was something that he did day by day, month by month, over the year. A couple of years. And so we see here evidence of persistent study of the word. Evidence, by the way, that I recognized in there in many places of his concern about Christian growth and development. He grappled with life. He grappled with his own life. Now, he believed, let me just run down through a few of these. He believed in those great fundamentals of Bible truth. And these can be noted in his Bible, but I just listed them here for quick reference. That Christ died for our sins. That the Bible is the trustworthy and authentic divine word of God to the human race. He believed that. He believed that we all need forgiveness. We all need cleansing from our sins by coming in faith to Jesus Christ as our Savior. By confessing our sins and ordering our life in obedience to his commands. He believed that Jesus is our heavenly high priest, even now officiating as our divine attorney, and that he has won our case. He believed that Christ is in fact coming soon. 
and that those who continue in confidence in their Savior Jesus will be ready for that glorious appearing. He believed those words of Jesus spoken in Revelation, which said, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And he believed that that Advent movement started so many years ago, ultimately producing the Seventh-day Adventist Church, was commissioned by God to help the Christian community and the world at large be prepared for the soon coming of Christ. And finally, in just the last few years of Lynn's life, I saw, it's interesting, I saw something. It's a beautiful thing in the lifespan, uh, the observer, observation of someone's lifespan, whether it's your own or someone else's, to see transition taking place. And in the last few years, I saw a quiet intensification of faith and trust in God as he wrestled with the weaknesses of the flesh. But I never knew him to complain. Now, not to me, not around me, I never knew him to complain. That's, that's my testimony of him. Speaking of his life generally, he had an interest in people. He seemed to love the social gathering, where at home, whether at home or in the community or in the church, in the workaday world. He engaged easily with people and they with him. He showed an interest, it seems, in everyone. <laughs> I was quite touched by his affection and relationship with Del, Delmer Klaus. Some of you will know, those of you who don't, um, in our little church there at Countryside, in the back, in the foyer, there's a pew there. And Barbara would sit with her son. Um, he was prone to make noises and so forth that sometimes disturb the congregation. Somebody said once that maybe he shouldn't come, but the church didn't take kindly to that. But when Lynn would come in, I saw this repeatedly. He'd come in, he'd go over to Dell, Dell sitting in the chair there or in the pew, and he'd get a hold of Dell's head and he'd rub him on top. Because Dell had or Lynn had learned if you leaned over to give Dell a hug, he'd do something like that to you. And Dell would get the jump, or Lynn would get the jump on him. Dell always loved to see Lynn coming. It just seemed that way. This was Lynn. He was always reaching out to those who were having a rough time trying to remember, trying to be aware of those who maybe needed a word of encouragement. How often he would ask when we would meet, when he'd come into the office, how you doing? With a smile like that. How's Linda? How's the family? Then he'd say, we're praying for you, brother. My conversations with Lynn were often an adventure in riddle. I probably can't do this justice, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, riddle in the sense of riddle me this or riddle me that. It wasn't that kind of thing. I had to read between the lines sometimes and try to decipher his language of the heart. I don't know if anybody else had that. Well, yes, I do. I do know. Somebody told me once, he talks in riddles. They didn't quite know what to make of it. Here's an example. Lynn, hey, I just wanted to check in with you to see if you might have some advice for me. 
I was talking with Alfred, not his real name. I was talking with Alfred the other day. Man, he is really hurting. He's got his tail feathers kinked. This thing's got him twisted in knots. I just listened. I don't know if I did him any good, but we talked a while. Anyway, I just wanted you to know. Maybe you've got an idea on this. I don't know if I should go over there or not. I don't know whether I should get into this. Just wanted to let you know how things were. Maybe you already knew. But I've been known to behind, be behind the curve on things like this. And folks, he still hasn't told me what it is. <laughs> but I knew, because I could read between his lines. We'd part company, and on the phone later, phone would ring. Hello? Lynn here. Hey, I thought I better just say, I wasn't... Don't get me wrong, he says, I wasn't trying to give you another assignment or tell you how to do your job. Just didn't want you to be out of touch, be out to lunch on this thing. He still hasn't told me what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to miss those conversations. <laughs> Lynn was a Barnabas. You remember reading about Barnabas in the Bible? Acts 4.36. The Bible actually defines this man named Joseph, calls him Barnabas, and interprets it as son of consolation. I think of Lynn that way, son of consolation. He would go out of his way just to try to encourage someone. Sometimes a ways out of his way. He loved the engagement around the study of the Bible. And the reason he loved that is because he knew that people would find grace and encouragement for their lives. He knew the powerful transforming effects of having a Christian fellowship in the family, in the community, and in the church. Lynn was a father in Israel. Lynn had his hand on the pulse of the church. Over the years, it's been my privilege to pastor in this conference many, many churches. The boards of elders have always been wonderful. And if a pastor listens to the boards of elders, his board of elders, he can stay out of a lot of trouble. And he can stay well informed. A lot of things that don't come to a pastor that come to other people, come to an elder. Lynn was one of those elders. He was sensitive to the spiritual needs of others and he always wanted others to know the peace and happiness that comes from fellowship with Jesus through the study of his word. He always helped me. It was an invaluable blessing for me, my ministry, to have someone like Lynn sidle up to me. And that, I mean that. He'd sidle up to me, just whisper a word in my ear, just to keep me informed of how things were going. What the spiritual temperature was under certain circumstances. Not telling me what to do. Just helping me. Sensitive to the spiritual needs of others. Doing what he could to make a difference. He was more than willing to help in the local needs of the church, investing time and energy. 
We're left picking up some big pieces, some projects for the church and the school, most of which was probably up in his head. And others like Stephen have to sort out, figure out how to pick it up. As I mentioned before, he was a committed staff member and his absence is going to be sorely missed. And I know most of all, Kathy, it's going to be felt so much keenly by you. Because you see, Kathy and Lynn, they were a team. And now, as someone has described Lynn as the man with the big voice, that big voice has been silenced till the resurrection. But what was it? Um, just the other day, day and a half, two days ago when I was there, we were sitting in the front room and talking and you were out of the room. Carol said, yeah, I just, I expect to see him bounding up the stairs. And then the room changes. Well, what's it going to be on the resurrection? I can see him bounding out of the grave. Smile on his face. Biggest smile that you've ever seen. As I went through his Bible, precious memories, I pulled out just three or four very pithy special references that he had marked. And where there were probably hundreds of these, I just want to share three or four of them with you. You've heard some of these. Man's extremity is what? God's opportunity. I heard Lynn testify to that more than once in the praise sessions. He's got something down a hole, he said. It's stuck. Doesn't look like there's any way to get it out. But what they do? They pray. There's only one way. If it's coming out, it's going to be because the Lord helps us get it done. Man's extremity. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. Another one. Kneeling in faith at the cross, man has reached the highest place to which man can attain. I love this one. Every sincere prayer is heard in heaven. It seemed a natural thing for Lynn to pray with people. Did you ever notice that, those of you who are circulating around with him? even on the job. Those who love God with all the heart will desire to give him the best service of the life and they will be constantly seeking to bring every power of their being into harmony with the laws that will promote their ability to do his will. I think Lynn struggled with that. He wanted that to be the case in his life. This one fits so much with the son of consolation. Unless there is practical sacrifice for the good of others, in the family circle, in the neighborhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, then whatever our profession, we're not Christians. And finally, this one, this one was actually tucked in this Bible. A remedy for every class of temptation. I said earlier, Lynn grappled with life. Lynn grappled with life. And I know this must have been extremely meaningful to him. Probably taken from some notes from somebody else, but he collected it 
because it struck a chord with him. For every class of temptation, there is a remedy. We are not left to ourselves to fight the battle against self and our sinful natures in our finite strength. Jesus is a mighty helper, a never failing support. None need fail or become discouraged when such ample provision has been made for us. Lynn was a man of faith. I think he would say with Paul, not that I have attained, but this one thing I do, I forget behind. I press on to the mark, to the prize of the high calling of God. pain but I can't see is there a light Can anybody hear me what perfect thank you sorry about that <clears throat> love smartphones well, I thought you were going to start singing. No. <laughs> <laughs> the pilgrims on the journey to the narrow road and Those who've gone before us Line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary. Their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us a heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. Only all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faith. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone And our children sift through all we've left behind May the clues that they discover And the memories they uncover Become the light that leads them to The road we each must find Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to hope.
Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Find us faithful Kathy, my sister, I want to thank you for inviting me to uh, have the honor of sharing a pictorial walk down memory lane of Lynn's remarkable life. I know that it's been said here that, or implied that this room is filled because of Lynn's influence, but it's also filled today out of love for Kathy, amen, and each of your family. I want to thank, uh, not my brother, but my cousin, for what you shared, Clint. I'll claim you as a brother, though, in the Lord. Everyone has a story, and everyone is a story. And blessed are those whose life story merges with God's bigger story and helps reveal God's gracious love. Such was Lynn Douglas Bartholomew's life. Lynn first emerged into this world on June 26, 1946. As we will see, he came riding full throttle and leaning into life. Born to Daryl and Lola Bartholomew in Spokane, Lynn grew up on the Nine Mile Road along the Spokane River with his parents and his brother Gary, who arrived about two years after Lynn was born. Since his dad was an avid outdoorsman, he spent many hours teaching his boys how to appreciate the outdoors. Packing trips into remote areas with their donkeys with heavy camping gear of that era were often the highlight of the year for all of them. Lynn attended Spokane Junior Academy for grades 1 through 10. That's where he met many of you. In fact, how many of you can track your life and Lynn's life back to the time of going to school together. Anybody raise your hand? I see a few here. In 1965, he graduated from Upper Columbia Academy. How many of you connect in that period of his life? Many more hands, all right? He went on to attend Walla Walla College, now Walla Walla University, for a year and one quarter. Anybody connect with that section of his life? All right. He then changed from an industrial arts major to an aircraft mechanics degree. It was while attending Walla Walla College, he met his future wife, Kathy. Little did he realize that switching colleges meant that he lost his educational deferment with the military and would soon be drafted. Since this was a time of the height of the Vietnam War, he was called up and was inducted into the Army on March the 28th, 1968, and shipped out to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where he spent several months training to be a medic. 
There he had the good fortune of being selected to serve in the White Coats, which was a medical research unit at Fort Detrick, Maryland. While there, he was in charge of the quarters from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. every day, every other day, and every other weekend. If things were quiet, he could pull out a cot and go to sleep at 11 p.m. So with other free hours in his week, he got a civilian job welding long span beams in nearby town. During his time in the White Coats, he participated in one medical research project. You can see, in fact, on the table, some of the military certificates and medals from this period on display there. And by the way, I, I just want to turn around and I want to point something out here. That picture right there, that was not actually when Lynn was in the military. This was later, and he's in his military duds, okay? It's pretty cool that he could still get into those. <laughs> Having proposed to Kathy, he took the two and a half weeks leave he had accrued and drove out from Maryland in his new Ford Torino. I remember this so vividly. It was a beautiful burgundy color. Arriving just in time for Kathy's graduation and their soon-to-be wedding on June the 8th, 1969. So what was it that attracted Kathy to Lynn while they were attending Walla Walla College? I asked her that question. It was a sparkle in his eyes his mischievous look in fun-loving ways. Anybody ever see that in his eyes? Mm. Mm. While on leave prior to heading back to Maryland with his new bride, Lynn took a week to build a trailer for their for Torino so they could haul their belongings back to Maryland. Note the car featured in the black and white photo. Right there. That was called the bomb. Okay? So following Kathy and Lynn's first date, and sis, I hope I got this right, his best friend coaxed him to take his future bride home in this beauty. <laughs> Boy, Lynn, you had a way of really making it good for your girl. Mm. What, was that right? Was it the first date? Second date, all right. Well, at least he gave her the first round as a bye, okay? After requesting a three-month early out from the military to continue his schooling, Kathy and Lynn returned to Washington in December 1969. And by the way, I want to say Washington State. I, I serve in the Midwest, and whenever I say Washington, they mean D.C. out there. So this is Washington State. After returning back to the Northwest, Lynn went on to finish aircraft mechanic school. After graduation in 1971, he took a job working as an aircraft mechanic in the remote village of Dillingham, Alaska. Located 400 air miles west of Anchorage on Bristol Bay, they left for Alaska on their second anniversary. Now, I want you to notice the picture in the lower section in the middle. What does that look like to you? A log cabin? That is Dillingham Air Terminal. Okay. By the way, I just have to go to this little site on this. Um, Lynn was an aircraft mechanic, didn't work on the jets that came in and out. But this is a gravel airstrip with jets. And they would blow tires. I see Danny's head going up and down. And uh, it was really an experience. I flew out of there one time, and I'm glad it was just one time. While Kathy worked at the native hospital, Lynn fixed airplanes, and they managed to enjoy the beauty and adventure of the isolated area they had moved to. He made friends with local pilots and hunted caribou, moose, and wolves. Since Dillingham is on Bristol Bay, Lynn was enticed to purchase a fishing boat and fish for salmon. And fortunately, the two years he fished, first by skiff with set nets, and then the second year by power boy, but were both very bad fishing years, and there was no getting rich those summers. In the summer of 1972, I fished with Lynn on the 7997. That's that craft there. It was called the Jerry. It leaked so badly, we threatened to rename it the Aquarium. Lynn sort of learned, sort of, I stress that, sort of learned that when a sign was posted, road closed in Alaska, the road wasn't fit even for four-wheel drives, as you will see in the top left picture. After working for hours with a handyman jack, anybody know what a handyman jack is? Boy, in, in Alaska, you don't travel without one of those. And hauling tree branches, both Kathy and Lynn, putting them under the tires, trying to get enough traction, Lynn finally relented and decided they would need to walk back into civilization. 
He was so tired, Kathy shared, that he actually, as they're walking at night, there are bears. She doesn't want to go to sleep, but he lays down in the middle of the road and just goes to sleep. Hmm. In the fall of 1972, his dad offered him a partnership that included converting their water well drilling business from cable tools to rotary drilling if he would come back and work with him in the business he had begun, that's his father, back in 1954. The call of the wild had lessened by then and Lynch, Lynn decided to return. Now commenting on these next pictures, Kathy shared, after moving back to Spokane and realizing we needed to put down roots, we purchased 20 acres of property that needed to be cleared of some down timber, most of which was right where the house would need to be built. Lots of hard work, exclamation mark. With the help of his dad, who had been a building contractor before he became a well driller, we built our home and moved in during March of 1977. Prior to this, they, hadn't been, they had been living in a trailer near their present home. After five years of marriage and no children, they decided to adopt. In June of 1974, they brought Jeff home from the hospital as an infant. Two years later, in July, they brought home Jody from the hospital, who was also an infant. Sadly, after five short, very short years, Jody tragically died of a very short illness. It was after Jody's sudden death they decided to adopt again. This time, through a series of miracles, they were able to bring three siblings, Dan, Sanji, and Janelle, from India to join their family. Several of the pictures you're looking at here document the reunion of Janelle, Sanji, and Dan when, they, when Lynn returned from India in April of 1983 with just Janelle. But it wasn't just, just Janelle. Lynn also brought Elizabeth, our four-month-old daughter, from India as well. Now, I want you to imagine this picture, 30-some hours trekking through international airports, a four-month little girl, a daughter, Janelle, that spoke no English, and a footlocker. Wow. The pictures in the top corners are at that moment of the reunion when the family, when he has landed. I have to tell you, this is the first moment Mary and I laid eyes on our daughter. And I remember taking pictures as the Republic Airline plane flew in. I was so excited that I kept trying to focus around the slash mark. It was an old Instamatic the whole time the lens cover was on. <laughs> it was just, I was so excited. But I just imagine what Lynn went through. He would take on anything. Hmm. Well, Lynn made sure his kids had a chance to go with him to work. Thus, the dirty faces of the girls. I hope you can see that. Okay. How many kids can claim donkey rides as part of their growing up experience? Not very many. But the girls weren't the only ones that had fun. The sons did too. Lots of fun. After overcoming the language barrier, the family settled into the routine of school, family life, and more fun. That's a great family picture. Time moved on, and as the children finished their schooling or moved into their careers, they began to add son-in-laws, that is Kathy and Lynn, and daughter-in-laws to their family. First Janelle married Paul Bailey, and then Sanji married Paul Knopf. She said, we are blessed with our two Pauls, whose dads, by the way, are both Bills. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> hmm. Then Jeff married Carolyn, and Dan married Anne. And then the delight of grandparenting came as well. Lynn and Kathy have a total of nine grandchildren. These several slides feature their grandchildren, ones that Lynn dearly loved. These pictures were taken a day before Lynn's death. Boy, Lynn loved fun. Hmm. And in the next picture, I'm not sure which kid in this picture is having the most fun, Lynn or the grandkids. Hmm. Not sure about that. Lynn and Kathy were blessed with several granddaughters. 
Lynn had a soft heart for children, and when he was in India teaching the nationals to drill, Kathy got a card from him that said something like this. If I was a rich man, your children would number as the sands of the sea. <laughs> okay, so, I'm sorry, that would got me. Sands of the sea. Thankfully for me, she adds, he wasn't that rich. <laughs> it's a great line, says. But she goes on to say with this picture, now we are blessed to be this many. And a great picture. The next few slides have to do with Lynn's work. Pastor Clinton spoke of that. I, uh, I worked with Lynn both as a fisherman and a short stint in helping him recover some um, lost tools down a hole in Alaska. Lynn uh, loved his work. I'm going to share what Kathy wrote about what you'll see. This is her voice speaking. As I remember, Lynn said his dad left him alone on the drill rig for a few hours for the first time when he was 12. So began his life as a water well driller, even though he thought he was going to be an aircraft mechanic. He wound up returning back to it. After going into business with his dad in 1972, he set about learning how to take his knowledge of cable tool drilling to rotary drilling. After military service, his brother Gary joined the well drilling team. As you can see, drilling was not a clean job, but he enjoyed the challenge of figuring out what was going on down the hole where you couldn't see. He had a sixth sense about that. It was so uncanny. In the mid-80s, the decision had been made to add hydrofracturing to Bartholomew drilling, and so Lynn bent his mind to research uh, needed and, uh, that what was needed and to set out to purchase and set up the needed equipment. In 1986, Northwest hydrofracturing became part of the Bartholomew drilling. In December of 1992, the drill rigs were sold, and Gary took over the pump sales and service, and Lynn took hydrofracturing. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment. How many of you are here today because of your connections to Lynn and Gary in that industry? Anyone here today? Yes, I see hands. He never tired of the challenges that would come his way when uh, doing his work. In fact, he relished them. In the late 1990s, he added well, uh, well rehabilitation to his repertoire, and he and Dan built the hose reel on the trailer from scratch. That's the one in the right-hand lower picture. He always credited his good friend in the industry, Dave Hansen, who he said uh, educated him about uh, rehabilitating wells. In retrospect, Lynn wished he had paid more attention to chemistry class. <laughs> in 1909, due to a new driveway giving way, he wrecked his frack truck and so ended up with the current one. And you saw back that truck leaning on its side. That was the older one, and then this one in the picture is the one that replaced that one. In 2003, Lynn, with his brother Gary and nephew Rod, brainstormed about the possibility of providing water to an orphanage school in Guatemala. And thus began the ministry known as Water for Life. Through this nonprofit organization, clean water and the gospel are provided to remote villages in rural northern Guatemala. I, I love that. Yeah, I love that picture on the right. Kathy yeah, says this little guy was trying to pull the pump handle, and Lynn just went over and helped out a little bit there. By the way, that's the way his life was, wasn't it? Often our lives are captured in those incidental moments that speak volumes quite loudly. After the wells were drilled for the orphanage and school, Lynn, along with numerous volunteers, built two huge water reservoirs that would replace the old open reservoir and provide clean water for about 700 people who previously had only the local contaminated river for their water needs. This project was one of the highlights of his life, and he remained active in it until 2010. Lynn loved his family and friends. There you see pictures of Lynn and Gary and their dad, and also Lynn and Gary playing their trumpets together. Many of you will see yourself in these next slides. So pay 
close attention. His love for you was great. And here are family pictures. Nothing made Lynn happier than being able to spend time with his family and friends, especially if it was on a holiday coupled with the great out of doors. Lynn's 60th birthday celebration at Priest Lake, which was one of the places that was most dear to his heart, that's where they went. There are many happy memories there as a family. Along with others who came for that 60th were Ken and Eleanor Campbell. Lynn was their Bible boy. Jim and Judy Homburg. Jim actually helped with the cabinets and the finish work in Kathy and Lynn's home. Jim knew Lynn since Lynn was a boy. Long time relationships. The next are pictures of them having fun. Several years ago, Lynn joined his college roommate, Bill Taylor, and longtime friend Ellen Williams for a men's retreat to Alaska. Lynn flew into Valdez, and there they went by a couple hundred miles road trip. They traveled then once they got to that part. 25 or more miles in the deep back backcountry by ATV over difficult terrain to a remote camp for a week of guys' fun. Everybody that weekend was packing. Kathy and Lynn, oh, some of you just got that, okay. <laughs> Kathy and Lynn toured Hawaii by helicopter with the Pomeroys. Then there was making cider with the Fletchers. Fun times. Fun times. In fact, I think it should have been, not Douglas, but Lynn Fun Bartholomew. In the next picture, we see all nine cousins on his mom's side, and they got together for this photo. Then there's Lynn with his uh, Bartholomew cousins, and then the next one is his nephew, Monty. Lynn and Kathy, Kathy not only adopted children, they also adopted a few adults like the Jensens and the Atwells. Lynn's uncle Bud is in his 90s. By the way, Lynn and his uncle were a lot alike. They both enjoyed working the crowd. <laughs> they both thought work, let me try this again, both thought work was most likely more fun than fun, especially if for Lynn it involved mud. <laughs> Lynn was an avid Huckleberry picker. Now, if you had been part of Lynn's huckleberrying for a while, you know that he and his dad, they invented this device, maybe there were other family members involved in it, that they could literally go in and comb huckleberries out, okay? Anybody who would go with him was welcome to join the adventure of the hunt for berries that were elusive, but oh, so tasty and worth it in the end. Now, the next picture is one that I particularly enjoy. On their 25th anniversary, Lynn bought Kathy a boat. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be like something silver, you know, something along that line. Pardon? It had a little silver on it, thank you. That was a redeeming quality. But actually, I just want to redeem Lynn here for just a moment. Actually, Kathy had wanted them to get this boat, okay? So I just want to be clear about that. So. It was, it was a great gift for everyone, including himself, okay? They had spent countless hours making memories on the water with their kids and friends. Lynn loved driving the boat more than being in the water himself. He just didn't particularly enjoy the cold water of the Northwest Lakes. Lynn's love for outdoor adventures ran through his life like a strong and ever-present heartbeat. There was hiking with the Fletchers in Canada. And then the picture on the right, in the early family years, snowmobiling with the kids. Then there was canoeing with friends on the Little Spokane River on a church outing. And then the last couple of summers, backpacking with young bucks. This was pure joy and a lot of sweat for them, particularly for Lynn. The first year, he wasn't 
he, had his, he was still back in the donkey packing era. He did not have lightweight gear. His pack was 85 pounds. Now, Lynn was 69 when he passed away. He's not a young buck. Kathy said the next time, which I, was it this last summer? Got it down to 65. <laughs> All right. I quote Kathy on this one. I always said, give Lynn a machine or a power tool and he'll tackle anything. He loved using his equipment, exclamation mark. Hmm. But that wasn't the only thing that Lynn enjoyed with family and all the fun things. Together they enjoyed dressing up. And we saw this picture earlier on the one on the left. Again, this is years later. He could still fit into his uniform. Okay? And then they also dressed up as Sarah and Abraham. Some time ago, they visited Guatemala and uh, took in some of the sights there. But most of all, Kathy and Lynn just loved being together. Did you notice that? It was just, they loved being together. And I just want to say this. They loved not only being with each other, but there was a wonderful teasing and banter that would go on between them. Snow and Kathy and Lynn just went together. From their earliest years to the picture of them in the snowsuits taken the weekend before Lynn died. This was the last recorded photo memory of them together. And to quote Kathy, thankfully God never forgets who we are. Amen? This last photo is taken looking west from their property and reminds us that though the sun is prematurely set in Lynn's life, we can look forward to the resurrection morning. Lynn looked forward to that grand reunion when Jesus returns, and he certainly was looking forward and planning to meeting each of you in that great going home morning when Jesus returns. For just a few moments this afternoon, we're going to continue the sharing. And I want to invite maybe just a small handful of you. I'm going to bring a, a roving mic around to maybe share some memories. And as I'm picking up the mic, I'll give you an opportunity to just think about that. At the end of that, I'm going to share a couple of final memories. But I encourage you to keep them short because we are a full house. Okay? And Kathy has asked if you would do a couple of things. If you would identify who you are and what your connection with Lynn is. Uh, this is actually uh, being shared live right now and probably recorded as well, and that information will be extremely helpful. So I think I have a, a remote uh, mic here. I laid it there between you gentlemen somewhere. There we are. All right, I'm gonna start in the back and work toward the front, okay? So for some of you, that's good news and give you a little longer to think. So I'm going to start in the back. And if you, again, would just uh, identify who you are and your connection with Lynn. And uh, for those of you that are in the balcony, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to make your way down. Anyone here toward the back who wants to just share a memory, a brief memory about Lynn? I worked for Lynn for 13 years, Carolyn Stencil, and it was a pleasure to work with him and Kathy. They were just fantastic employers. Thank you, Carolyn. Anyone else here toward the back? Okay, I'm going to start making my way toward the front. So anyone here that would like to just share a brief memory? Um, Trisha Weaver and I grew up with him at Countryside and we had a reunion um, I want to say a couple years ago at Countryside and my last memory of him is taking him on in a soccer game and he was pretty intense so um, he was definitely not going to be rolled with in his late 60s here and he was just as aggressive as all of us. In fact, I had to put ice on my shins, and I'm certain I'll always carry a little dent from Lynn. All right. Lynn, passionate? Hmm. 
Okay. Anyone else? Yes. I'm Kenny Campbell, my wife Eleanor. November the 4th, 1951, Central Church. Len was five years old and he was our Bible boy. He was enthusiastic. He did a great job. 1997, we sold our property, our home, and our business. 100 cars, trailers, tires, junk. I didn't know how it's ever going to move. And unbeknownst to me, Lynn organized a deal, and a whole bunch of countryside people with trailers and trucks came out. Last time I water skied or tried to was behind Lynn's boat. And I fell down enough that he said he wasn't sure that I was water skiing or he was trolling for sturgeon. <laughs> Rick uh, Pomeroy, we, uh, we moved here 13 years ago, knew nobody. I was transplanted from the East Coast. The only people was our immediate family. In our first week of uh, attending church at Countryside, well, there's a stranger in the church. We went home for lunch at Bartholomew's. and been uh, many meals there since then. I'm, I'm going to miss the guy <laughs> big time. Uh, and one of the things that you're talking about is enthusiasm. I, uh, a lot of you will... Think of this, whenever he got really excited about something, he put his hands together, really rub them fast on that. You know, you could tell he was ready to go for whatever it was. My name is Terry Gum, and um, I met Lynn in 1988. And that year, actually the next year, my husband announced in church that he had, well, he wasn't my husband yet. He asked, he announced that... <laughs> that he had asked me to marry him. And then he passed the mic off. And so Lynn pipes up, well, we want to know what she said. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say, Lynn was always the one who would just stand across the room at church. And it's like he would just pick out everyone who needed encouragement. And he'd go to them. And, and he had done that just to me. Uh, we'd had communion Friday, um, the night, the Friday before he died. And I remember he did that to me then. And I just praise him for all the encouragement he's given me over the years. He even came down to my work once with a quote just to encourage me. And um, I know he did that with a lot of people. He's definitely going to be missed. John Brownlee. For the last two and three quarter years, Lynn sat on my right in staffing at Countryside. And that's going to leave a big hole in our staffing. It's going to leave a big hole in our hearts. But I know that if Lynn could make a request of you, the request would be to remember the projects that Lynn discussed with us, not only for the Countryside Church, but the projects that are important so that each one of us Someday soon, I hope, can walk the golden streets with Lynn. And so remember the projects of the church in your prayers, and also remember Lynn's family. I remember Lynn in Pathfinders. I was one of his leaders, Jim Homburg. And I've never talked with Lynn any time, anywhere, but what he'd ask you how you are spiritually. And that was always a, a good thing. And uh, we had many laughs together and worked together too some. A great guy. I think I've been favoring this side, so I'm going to look over here. Yes. Michelle McDonald. My little sister came down from Alaska and I introduced Lynn and her. I said, Mary, this is Lynn Bartholomew. He's been a big brother to me. And Lynn said, hmm, I never had a sister before. <laughs> and that's what he was to me all through the years. 
While we were building Countryside Church, up on the roof, putting the shingles on for the first time, for some reason I was wearing a skirt and pants. And Lynn reached over with his staple gun and stapled my skirt to the roof. <laughs> I know, Kathy, that that mischievous side was fun, but did you know how tough it was going to be, too? It's like, wow. Anyone else? Right in here. Where? Right here. Uh, Virgil Minden. First time I met uh, Lynn, we were both teenagers, and we were visiting our aunt and uncle in Salem, Oregon. That was Greg Crumley, who was married to Florence Dick, who was a sister to Lynn's mother. And he was two and a half years younger, and so he was a little kid. However, he was considerably taller than I was, but he knew exactly where he wanted to go, and I didn't have the foggiest where I wanted to go. But we've kept in touch. He's been very encouraging and compassionate all through our history together. My name is Sean McCormick. Two years ago, my family and I retired. We left Italy and didn't know exactly where to go. But we were welcomed by Lynn and Kathy. They adopted us as well. Always made us feel at home. James Pello. And uh, I remember back in the mid 80s, uh, my parents split up and we moved to Spokane and uh, the Bartholomew families, both Gary and Lynn and their families were such an incredible support to us. We felt like part of the family in so many ways. After school every day we would go home and, and uh, as kids wait at one of their families, play at one of their families' homes until my mom was done with, with work and could come and pick us up. And uh, I have to say, some of, w without those two families, uh, our lives would have been pretty rough in those years. And uh, both families are just really dear to us. I'm uh, Mark Black, <clears throat> and uh, I got to know Len, first of all, uh, through ASI. And he was an ASI member, and really, he was really what ASI is all about sharing Christ in the marketplace. And, you know, I, I believe Lynn, uh, you know, we got to know Lynn on a personal level when we moved to this side of the mountains. Uh, Barbara, my wife, who couldn't be here, she's doing volunteer work right now. But she worked with uh, the school. We had two daughters go through the countryside school. And then she was on the school board for a number of years. Got to know him that way. But... I really believe from my involvement with ASI and him, um, I served as the national vice president for a couple of years, and I see that with Lynn, he inspired a lot of young people to recognize that no, no matter what career path the Lord took them in, that first and foremost they were witnesses for Christ, and that they should be concerned about the spiritual realities around them and I saw that in his life and in his practice and inspired me and I know it's inspired a lot of young people and many others I just want to let you know we're gonna have just several more okay All right I'm Kelly Coverstein um, I met Lynn Bartholomew um, when I married Ray Coverstein in 1990 and his love for kids is absolutely incredible and spiritual well-being and he took up Bible studies with my two oldest um, Kyle and Katie and um, after Samuel Mirzma moved away and my kids their spiritual well-being was first and foremost with them and they did however learn a new word from him woolly boogers I saw a hand here. I'm Alan Hanna, and uh, 
Lynn and I met each other in 1967, and that was at the aircraft school that we both went to, and uh, he was a wild and crazy guy. We had great fun. We, uh, we were a fierce team bucking rivets together, building some, some aviation parts. I lost tra track of Len until, oh, within the last year, I suppose, and uh, he and I uh, caught up with each other. I was coming back in from Nine Mile. We live really not very far from Len is the amazing part. And uh, I saw him putting water in his, in his hydrofrac rig. And that little voice said, hey, go back and see Len. So I came back and turned around and went back and had a, a wonderful time with him. And uh, he's just a great friend to me. Henning Gouldhammer. Um, I joined the Countryside Church uh, as pastor in 1980, and Lynn was kind of one of the first people I met, and he took me under his wing. Um, we were worshiping at the Grange, but building a church, and so I spent many hours with Jim Homburg and Gary and lots of others working on that church. Uh, Lynn introduced this Danish transplant to huckleberries, Christy and me, and uh, camping in the North Cascades, and I have to, I could tell you a lot of things maybe later, but I have to second Clinton Schultz's comments about cryptic. Lynn would get really soulful, and he would get a little weepy, and he'd be talking about some situation, and I didn't have the heart to tell him, Lynn, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Just a couple of more here, maybe toward the front. Okay, a couple here, and then we're going to sw swing up. I see a, fan, uh, a hand in the family section. About the first week, oh, my name is Phyllis Radu, and I'm a member at the Countryside Church. About the first week in December, Lynn showed up on Wednesday at my classroom, and he didn't expect that I would be there. And um, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I had some things to get together. And he said, oh, okay. So he said, well, I just came down to the school to put the fear in all your kids that they better behave while you're gone. <laughs> and so he uh, went in and talked to each one of them while I was in the room next to the classroom that he was talking to them in. So I just left the door open, was listening to him. And he was asking each one, how are you doing today? You know, what do you plan to learn today? And... Um, it was just interesting the way he, he came so that he could give support to each of the kids. And I just really appreciated that. The kids loved him. Before he left the classroom to come back into the library where I was, he said, now, you be good to your substitutes or Mrs. Radu will get you. My name's John Woodbury. I was one of Gary's teachers at Upper Columbia Academy, uh, Lynn's teachers. And I can remember one incident with uh, Lynn. He came into my office, I was in the gymnasium working on my history class, and he came in and he said, John, he said, I just saw a faculty member and his date come into the campus, what should I do? I don't know, and I said, Lynn, what should you do? He said, I don't know. And that's one of the memories I can remember of Lynn. He was, had that big twinkle in his eye when he was talking about it. He, he thought I should tell him, t t tell a principal about it, I guess. <laughs> one thing about Grandpa that I do remember is almost every time I'd come, he would give me a head noogie. Almost every time. Michael Knopf. Um, I don't really re have a memory of when I first met him. I mean, he was probably around when I, right after I was born. <laughs> um, but I will share the last memory I remember of him the day before he died. Um, he did really like snow and equipment. He made some of the best sledding hills I remember. Um, 
He almost got his tractor stuck. <laughs> um, I think that without him and what he does for all us grandchildren, I don't think that it's really going to be the same. I just want to say that I'm very grateful that the Lord gave me 46 and a half years with a terrific guy. I think we'll let Kathy have the last word on that. The other morning as I was uh, doing my devotions in uh, Lynn and Kathy's home, I was sitting at the kitchen table. I was also working on some preparatory things. I was thinking about this service. And I looked across the kitchen and looked at the refrigerator. If you've ever been in Kathy and Lynn's home, you know that the refrigerator is a picture board. And... Um, I know that many of those people that are on that picture board, Lynn and Kathy have prayed for. As I was looking at this, I was drawn to the picture that is going to be on the screen right now. Here you have his son Dan and his son Allah. If I've got that right, is that Dan and Paul? Okay, I just want to make sure I got this right. As I look at this picture, I thought to myself, this picture really captures Lynn. First of all, he's having fun with others. But he's in a supporting role. Have you noticed that? He is launching, suddenly I can't say the word, clay pigeons. Just couldn't pull that up, okay? He's, he's throwing those. This is a cheap operation, okay? No automated pigeons here, folks, okay? There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, shells on the ground. And as I looked at that, there, it just embodies because Lynn is leaning. He is loaded, he's cocking, and he's firing. I want to take you to something that many of you have never witnessed in Lynn's life. Because I've stayed, my wife and I, many times with Kathy and Lynn over the years. I would come up into the living room in the mornings, and Lynn would be there very early with his Bible, his study materials, and he was quietly studying and reading. Lynn lived a very full, leaning life and did a lot of cocking and a lot of firing. Sometimes there were even some missed shots in that, okay? But let me tell you what loaded his life. It was with his walk with Jesus. And it grew out of that daily quiet time with the Lord. Kathy told me that he did that very, very consistently in his life. Just several weeks before Lynn died, he and I had a conversation. Usually when I called, I usually got Kathy, but Lynn answered the phone this time. And uh, I'd been going through a very unique stretch in my life journey filled with a lot of uncertainty. And I was sharing with Lynn that uncertainty. And Lynn listened we talked, we chatted, and then he dropped just a simple one-liner. By the way, I got this one, <laughs> okay. You know, was it, you know, tail and knot and all that stuff. He said, life is a classroom. And as I began to understand some of the things that had been unfolding in his life, I understood that he wasn't speaking just to me, he was speaking out of his own life classroom experience. And that was literally a message from God into my heart at that time because it wasn't a classroom I wanted to be in at that point. It had been a long classroom, we'll put it that way. But as I pondered that and I, I thought about that, I thought, man, that is really a blessing to me. And a few days went by and I said to myself a couple of times, I need to call in and I need to thank him for that. And I didn't. Now, some of us here today have regrets of things that we wish we had said or things we had done or not done or said. Some of those things are with Lynn and some of those things are in family relationships. But you know what I know Lynn would say about that to us today? Don't live with regrets. Don't live with regrets. 
Because here's what happened in that phone conversation. The very last thing, and you've already heard it here, what do you think Lynn wanted to do? He wanted to pray. And so he prayed with me that day. As I think about Lynn's life, there was one thing, and I'm going to use one text to summarize it all. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's what Lynn would want us, regardless of our life experiences, the ups and downs. He knew, as Pastor Clint shared, he was not perfect. He made a lot of mistakes, and he would be the first to admit that. But what he also remind us is, don't look at that. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can look to you as our Heavenly Father with um, hope and anticipation of the resurrection to come. Lynn has laid off the burdens of this life, but now we look with anticipation to Jesus' soon return and that great resurrection day. Lord, we thank you for the comfort of your Holy Spirit. We want to ask for that comfort to be with each one as we part company today, as we continue in our life experience, remembering, cherishing these memories that we have of Lynn. Go with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The family would like, us, like you to know that um, there is uh, meal preparation downstairs, and anyone that wants to come is available, or <laughs> welcome to come. And uh, we'll just, we won't have any formal um, ushering out. You just, this is the end of the service now, and so uh, you're free to mingle and uh, visit and begin to move toward the supper area.